All right. All right. We're live, everybody. Okay. Welcome to What Are Your Thoughts? My name is Downtown Josh Brown. I'm here with my co-host, Michael Batnick. Michael, say hello to the folks. Hello, hello. All right. I want to say a quick hello to some people that are joining us live tonight. We love, we love that you guys are here for the live. Roger is here. John Carlos, Sean, Rachel, what's up? Dave Wilson is here. Uh, Cliff is here, of course. Jay Luther, of course. All the regulars are in the house tonight. We appreciate you guys. Some new faces and names as well. Thanks so much for joining us. We do the show every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Before we get into what we want to talk about today, uh, Michael would like to tell you a little bit about tonight's sponsor. Well, a company called Charts. maybe you've heard of them. I use them every day. They've got a new exciting tool for advisors called Proposals, which displays beautifully like mm. a before and after. You're in this portfolio. We want to get you in this portfolio. It shows uh, you the differences as you're presenting a portfolio to a client. You can see what you're offering that they don't currently have in their existing portfolio. This is game important. Game changer. Yeah. Uh, and our chief operating officer, Nick Majuli, is doing a webinar with them on 922. So if you want to see that handsome devil talk about what Ycharts is up to with their proposal tool, hit the, lo- hit the show for the, uh, the link for the notes, the show for the notes, the link for the show. You know what I'm trying to say. And Nick Majuli is low key, an absolute technology gangster. So if you're going to watch mm. anybody demo the Y charts product, that's the guy. That's the guy. All right. Uh, I feel like we missed the show last what, week. Are right? you starting off with a. No, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm I missed to, the show last week. I'm trying to remember like I, how we start the show because I, we did this in California. I had things to say, but didn't get a chance to. So we're going to say it today. All right, All right Josh. First question on everybody's mind where's a recession? Coming any where's minute. Where's a recession? Can't you feel it? All right. Can you feel I, it coming in the air tonight? Did you see, uh, wait, did you see the new Chris Stapleton Snoop Dogg rendition of Come, uh, In the Air Tonight, the Phil Collins song? For, uh, I think it was for Monday Night Football. I no. think they, pre- they premiered it last night. It's like Chris Stapleton covering Phil Collins in the air tonight. They got the drummer. I think she's the drummer from Lenny Kravitz's band. And then Snoop comes out. Hmm. And Snoop drops a verse over uh, over Chris's guitar playing. And it's, you know who else it's covered last night? Pretty fire. Me with the Saints and the and the Steelers. No big deal. Okay, so this well has done. been Bo- oh this both is, game both games. Well done. I money lined and I teased. I don't like hit. too. I don't like too Monday Monday night football games. It's too much. It's it's like too it's much. Lot. It's a lot. It's too much. All right. All right. Um. So this is we've 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 been experiencing a historic. Non-recession. Unprecedented rate hiking cycle. What was that? A, a historic non-recession. <laughs> it's one for the one for the record books. Uh, yeah. All right, turn on, please. Let's get it started. All right. So the black line is where we are today. For those of you who are listening, I'm showing a chart from the Wall Street Journal, uh, showing it's showing all the interest rate hiking cycles going back to 1988. And some the black line long- is th- is this one that started in in 22. Some lasted longer than the one that we're currently in. We're 18 months into this thing, but none of them yeah. have been as extreme in terms of the amount of tightening. So we raised 525 basis points, and not only did we do that, but we did it coming off zero. And so this was supposed to do some very obvious things: slow down the economy. It's definitely hurt the housing market, but it hasn't really. And it, it hurt some technology stocks, hurt their valuations, but it hasn't really impacted the overall economy. You could make say whatever you want, but the bottom line is the unemployment rate is still 3.5%, okay? So it hasn't done what they thought it would do, what I think most market observers, market participants, economists, strategists, what everybody thought it would do, which is lead to a recession. And maybe it's coming, but it's not here yet. So there's this really great chart from Deutsche Bank. It's so great that I have no idea what it's saying, but I get the gist. I get the chance. I'll, I'll explain it. Pop okay, it. fine. Chart, please. Chart on, please. Let's hear it, smarty pants. <laughs> Recession versus leading indicators. Nearly all leading indicators suggest the U.S. should have already oh, dude, entered I recession. I could read two. I could read in two. In fact, explain the chart. it should have entered one long ago back in September, October last year. We had a recession in Silicon Valley. We had it. We had a stock market crash in NASDAQ, and we had a Silicon Valley recession. Next question. Sir? It Sir? ended with the blow up of Silicon Valley Bank. All right. All right. I'm telling Listen, you, we had one. Chart off, please. I got to see this asshole. 
You don't know what this chart means any more than I do. No, but this is what I do. <laughs> uh, sir, I'm a television star. Here's sir, how this works. Don't, they ask a question. Sir, triple sir. You can't read the chart. You don't know what it means. I, I don't, don't know what need it means. to. They ask me a question I don't know the answer to. I say the thing that I wanted to say anyway, and then it's a commercial. Who taught you that? And Who no taught one that? even realizes Who it. Who taught you that? Give that Barry. respect. Give that Barry. respect. Okay. But this is how I do. So as Throw we the were chart say, out. As I we said say, the chart is showing all of – chart back on, please. The chart is showing all of the leading economic indicators. So core capex, ISM, University of Michigan consumer expectations, margins, like all, all of them. And again, I don't know what this chart is showing, but I know what, what it's is saying. Blue and what is the blue and what is the I yellow? Don't know. What it's are a those standard deviation. Was that a sigma? I don't know. But the the point is this. <laughs> <laughs> the point is this. Nearly nearly all leading indicators suggest that the U.S. should have already entered a recession. In fact, it should have entered one long ago, back in September or October. So hold, hold, why, hold on, hold on. What are you doing? What the hell are you doing? I, Josh is I had to, off screen. I had to pick up that Sigma you just dropped. Oh, uh, <laughs> there you go. Oh, listen, I found something interesting. I found a little tidbit of a nugget in uh, Nick Timoreo wrote an article, why a soft landing could prove elusive. Okay. And this, this, uh, there's a face blower right here. Did you know where soft landing came from? Like the term? Yeah. No. The 1969 moon landing propelled the soft landing expression into the economic lingo in the early 1970s. The Nixon administration officials sought to conquer high inflation without triggering a severe downturn. How about that? So like they used space te uh, terminology to, it was as a like soft, a metaphor for the, okay. It was a soft landing on the moon. So why do you think we haven't seen a recession? And don't tell me because unemployment is low. Like why hasn't there been layoffs why no, has why it can't we but why can't i talk all right so here here it is when they teach this at business school i wouldn't know i've never been to business school my guess is what they'll have to teach is and in 2002 we learned that the economy was a lot less sensitive to overnight rates than we once thought like that will be the less that that'll be the takeaway from this but right? i think that's the wrong takeaway mm. So you, you so the reason i think the reason i think the economy is sensitive to overnight rates however during the pandemic, all of these companies gorged on and record, consumers and consumers and consumers yes. and consumers on record cheap debt. And so remember, actually, remember we said how many times did we say that if there's a recession, the consumer and the corporation have never been better posi positioned or better prepared to go into yes, it. Yes, but we shouldn't have said that. Sheets. We shouldn't have said that. Because and and what we should have said was the they're so prepared that it will stave off a you recession. You can't have it. That's right. Exactly. So that you was my takeaway. It. That was the interesting takeaway. Chart on, please, from Renaissance Macro Research. We use volatility, the VIX, as a liquid as a liquidity indicator. It's amazing that we're testing multi-year lows this deep in the tightening cycle. Hell yeah, it is. Wait, VIX as a liquidity? Yeah, yeah. Why are we at Why are we at a, a low teens VIX? It's nuts. Like given given everything the Fed has thrown at this market. And all the fiscal stuff that's wound down, but it just, they did so much stimulus and so much refinancing activity that it just made overnight rates not matter. Yeah. Like they will matter. They do they, matter, but they didn't matter this time for they the reasons don't that we matter discussed. To, right. They don't matter to the degree that they could throw us into a recession. If you're and already, it, if you're already taken care of with debt. It doesn't matter what the cost of money is. Now it does matter, but it doesn't matter for this period of time. So I posited a few weeks ago with Ben that there will be rolling recessions and maybe the economy can stave off a recession. Maybe it can't, but maybe it can. So we already had it works. We're in it in housing for sure. We already had it in technology. We had it in freight. So for example, Connor sent uh, tweeted, um, uh, Hollywood. Yes. Full on recession. If you, uh, if you, if you rent costumes to Hollywood productions right now, your thumb is up your ass. You're doing oh, literally nothing. Uh, office real estate, obviously full blown, right? Yeah. Office furniture, full blown. Okay, yeah. so uh, the president of J.B. Hunt said that the freight recession might be over. Quote, so I've talked about us being in a freight recession now for several quarters. I might change that slightly to say that we're coming out of a freight recession. That's interesting. Connor Sen retweeted and said, echoing Walmart's cautious optimism this week and Amazon close today at a 52-week high. Is Walmart at a 52-week high? Close. It's really close, it's, right? it's pretty close. But Amazon last week hit a hit a fifty two week high. 
and most of that business, most of the revenue of that business is consu- directly related to the consumer. AWS is like 17% of revenue or something. So, you know, the Amazon and Walmart are telling you that we th- there's still no sign, you know, wor- worth talking about. Um, I thought this was interesting. I think this is like the biggest mystery on Wall Street. I asked the guy, so last week at Future Proof, I went to this uh, really elite private party that you didn't get invited to where Joe and Tracy were interviewing the new guy taking over as CIO at Oak Tree, like the real Howard Marks, like the guy that's like managing the money. And I forget his name, but it's on their podcast. You can oh, yeah? Who else it. is at this party? Um, Me. Matt Mids, I don't know. Like, the people that really were important were there. Uh, Joe and Tracy interviewed him, and he's a credit guy because it's Oak Tree. And I didn't stay because I went to a different party. But How exclusive gist- was that one? Was that the super exclusive one? Like super, the super exclusive. One? So I asked him before. before he, so they did a live podcast there. It was on the roof of, like, the Hilton or something. Or uh, the roof of the Hyatt or something. Anyway, uh, Paseya. So they asked him whatever they asked him, but I like butted in before they went on stage. And I was like, why aren't credit spreads moving? Like, why won't HYG or JNK, like, why is there absolutely no sign that there's any impact after all these rate hikes? And he's like, I honestly don't know. And he is, again, at Oak Tree. Like, he, they literally eat, sleep, and breathe credit. And so this is, I think, the bis- biggest mystery on Wall Street. Um, this is a tweet somebody sent me to get my, like, what do you think, Josh? I don't really know, but I thought this was the, the right question. This is David Deer King. Do you know who this is? Mm-mm. He's a Street.com reporter or okay. Street.com columnist, something. Of all the things that baffle me about this market, this might be the biggest one. How in the world are high yield spreads going down right now? Consumers are running out of money to spend, debatable. Consumer credit is through the roof. Defaults are rising. Bankruptcies are rising. We've got de facto recession in Europe. China is imploding. Student loan payments just restarted. Yet investors are demanding less return for low quality bonds. I don't get this at all. This looks like a setup for the end result gets really ugly. And then it's a chart of the ICE B of A US high yield index option adjusted spread so this would be i guess the the yield above the comparable uh treasure comparable maturity treasury yeah mm-hmm. okay um and it is at three spot seven eight so you're you're getting like three and change percentage points above the comparable treasury for the high yield index of bonds well what he's asking is basically where's the recession it's the same thing but well, that's why I, I bundled it in here. But he's yeah. more like, but this is like more than recession. This is almost like market pricing. Like, is the market not responding to any negative information whatsoever with respect to um, consumer credit or rising bankruptcies or default? So I have a few answers to this, and I wanted to see what your thoughts are. My first answer is everyone's working. I don't think you could see spreads blow out with unemployment at three and a half percent it's just like it's hard for me to understand why they would they and there might be a a, a, an uptick in bankruptcies and defaults but they are not like quote unquote skyrocketing they are not even outside of the realm of normal john throw the chart on we've got a bankruptcy chart keep talking can we can we do it like does he does he know where to find it okay next one please boom yeah, all right. So, like, go back to the year 2000. We're at the low end of low. I mean, it's off zero, but, like, come on. There's fine, here. fine. All right, so I said that. The second thing, put my other thing back on. Uh, put the tweet back up. If you look – so I'm not a credit guy. But if you look at what makes up the index that he's referencing here with his chart, the B of A uh, U.S. High Yield Index – um, I think 24% of it is consumer cyclical fine, but 11% is energy. And typically in the early stages of a recession, um, you might see some like nervousness around commodity related companies. Um, energy, they've transformed their balance sheets over the last year or two. And crude oil hit a 10 month high today. So like you're not going to see it in the usual suspects 
in the high yield index. You're not you're just not going to have energy companies have bond prices that are that are struggling. So that's why you're not seeing it blow out there. Um, so the, the combination of everyone's working, energy bonds are 11 percent of this industry. Oil is fine. But Josh, usually 35 percent of this is consumer. I said that consumer. And then another 15 percent. Another 15 percent is corporate communications. These. Okay. Yeah, so that, okay, fine. So nobody, listen, what's the last thing people get rid of in a recession? Cell Their phone, cell phone. Netflix, last, yeah. literally last. Take my car first. So you won't see it there. You won't see it in, in energy. So take communications, take energy, put those to the side. Consumer cyclical. So I don't know, I don't know specifically what companies make up high yield consumer cyclical debt. I'm guessing it's not Walmart and Costco and Amazon. No. Um, but, you know, that's maybe that's where the surprise is, but that's not the whole index. So that's that's my take. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you can get a spike in spreads if there is like an event. Yeah, but absent a real it's probably recession, how this ends. It's probably yeah, how this ends. To be honest, yeah, probably, probably. I'm, yeah, but absent that, you're not going to see spreads blow out. Uh, there's gotta be, a, there's gotta be a catalyst. Something, right. Something has to like materially change the way people are behaving that so, and, so, and rates weren't enough. So next charge on the, the performance one of the, of the leveraged loans versus investment grade bonds. This is wall street journal today. So the difference between leveraged loans and other bonds is duration. These are floating rates. It's all credit risk and credit is fine. This and is until- part of the biggest mystery on the street. So. Rising interest rates are boosting risky corporate loan returns instead of hurting them. This is one of those weird things. That is confounding. Okay, so let me just read this real quick. It is one of the biggest surprises on Wall Street, the outside performance of risky corporate loans. That's a leveraged loan. Since the start of last year through Friday, loans backed by companies including PetSmart and Uber in the Morningstar LSTA US Leveraged Loan Index delivered a return of 9.3%, buoyed by higher interest rates in a resilient economy, Investment grade bonds lost 13% in that time. That's incredible. Yeah, well, because there's a lot of interest rate sensitivity. Last year, and the, S- up- and the S&P is down about 4%. So this is starting from January 2022. Investment grade bonds down 13. S&P stocks down 4%. This shit is up 9%. And it's another one of these things that people are like, wait, what the fuck? I think, like, junk, wh- bonds this- outperform- I think junk bonds outperform treasuries. They did there's last not a- year. Because um, it's, it's a tiny market, compar- comparably. No, it's because there's not dura- there's not as much duration risk. So that's not all. as much duration. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Before you do, I just want to say that I, you're trying to flex on me. I party with the people. Just saying, I party with the people. I'm just kidding. I didn't. St- I didn't stay at that party either. Not a flex. All right, go ahead. You could have. No, you yeah. could have gone. No, but you literally could have gone there. All right. Uh, oil prices. Uh, WTI. This was as of this morning. Up WTF. One yeah. WTI crude up 1% to 92, Nat gas up 4% to 284, US crude making 10 month highs. Um, US oil output continues to fall three months in a row, according to the EIA. This is the bull market right now. The stocks don't go up every day with oil, but these stocks look better since, uh, let's say, the end of July than anything else I see in front of me. And uh, here, Sean put this in my notes today. Energy stocks still aren't overbought. What's with the Zero- yellow? Uh, wait, what, yellow what? In August. I think that was someone's birthday. Uh, no, that was the bottom. So um, here. Hashtag technicals. 0% of the XLE has an RSI above 70. Only 4% of XLE components are at 50-day highs. This is a weird which chart. Is, which is below the 11%. What is this? Percentage of XLE stocks advancing for five. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of saying that it's not carried away yet. So what are your thoughts? On which part specifically? Um, bull market continues. Would you get in the it, way of this? Would the, you fade this? Market, I wouldn't. No, I own energy. Yeah. I uh, bought IEO. Um, put, up, put up crude oil. I think this is what, definitely – listen, I don't know shit about uh, energy, but this what is happens, not hot. What thing. happens next? Just purely on technicals, what happens next? I show you this chart. It's, yeah, it's going higher. It's going higher. Is this the big risk for inflation reaccelerating? I'm and, so glad you asked. And softening consumer demand? Wait, we have a couple more charts, and then we're going to answer that question. Because gas prices – I know WTI is not necessarily gas price, but they're correlated. 
That's what that's Gasoline. what messes with people's brains. Yeah, no shit. Um, give me natural gas real quick, John. Thank you. Uh, you can see this is a breakout, possibly in the making. Although there have been several failed breaks above three. And then let's see. I want to buy this that. Is, this is IE. Well, you technically own it. You own IEO, right? So yeah, these but I are all like UNG. Okay. So IEO and XLE side by side, you see these are effectively the same trade. They bottomed sometime in um, March of this year during the banking crisis. They double bottomed at the end of June, and they are the best show in town really since the end of July versus the rest of the stock market. Um, the question that you're asking, when will higher prices for oil and or prices at the pump affect the economy. November. And uh, I'm glad you asked. Second There's week of November. Some divergence of opinion here. Uh, but I agree with you. This could become the next risk that people are focused on. We've seen it before. Edyard Denny just raised the odds of a recession before the end of 2024. And he cited specifically higher oil prices and widening deficits. Um, the 30% <clears throat> spike in oil since late June has given him reason to reassess. Uh, quote, today, in response to several new developments, we are raising the odds of a recession before the end of next year from 15 to 25 percent. OK, um, Nick Colas, who is a frequent guest on the show, has a different point of view. Nick doesn't think that a rally in crude matters until it doubles, which I, I found really interesting. Yeah. So let me wow. break this down for you. Crude is at over 90 a barrel for the first time since November 2022. Nick is saying oil price spikes matter much more than modestly rising prices. That's what we've had this year, modestly rising prices. We haven't had a spike. He says household income is fairly fixed in the near term. So spiking oil and gas prices force people to quickly cut back on other spending categories. The greater the increase, the more likely the recession eventually unfolds. And he has a chart. I'll, not, I'll narrate this. The following chart shows the year-over-year -year change in WTI crude prices from 1987 to 2019. As noted, oil prices essentially doubled or more in September 1990, February 2000, and June 2008. Um, one was because of the invasion of Iraq. The latter two were super cycle peaks. Regardless, the U.S. economy was either in recession when oil prices doubled or would shortly be in one. So this is a causation correlation thing that we can argue, but... Um, the good news is the magic number, according to Nick, for when oil prices would double um, would be like $140 a barrel, meaning most of the summer we sat at like $70 before it took off. So we are nowhere near 140 and we're working our way up slowly. So he doesn't view this as an imminent like thing that could cause a recession. That's a good chart. Uh, and that guy Unless knows. something changes. And Nick knows his shit. The CEO of Chevron just came out and said we're going to $100 a barrel, which I guess is not a bold call from 93. Um, I think that'll change psychology a little bit, though. What do you think? I think Nick's right. I think that the the speed is at least as important as the, uh, the level. By the way, um, Jamie Catherwood said the comp he, – he slacked me the other day. The compound you did with Data Trek guy was unreal. Genuinely yeah. re reignited my interest in finance podcast. Casually threw it out, uh, threw it on at like midnight last night, thinking I'd watch for five minutes, and then I watched it all. Yeah, Nick um, is, dude, Nick is the man. I said, I said to Jamie, he's absurd, and no, I will not make an introduction. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Nick is the Nick is Nick is absurdly great. Uh, we want to be in the Nick Colas business. Anyway, oh, wait, I, I thought that one was more chart, One more chart, one more chart. Chart on, please. Look at this one. So this is from Bloomberg, the driver of oil prices. And this is not, it's more of a demand thing, which is interesting, than a supply thing. So Ooh. this is not the economy softening? Yeah. Huh. Right? Yeah, not yet. It's, not, it's definitely not here. All right, Josh, anything else before we move on? Uh, no, let's go. Okay. Uh, Warren Pies. Another phenomenal macro dude, bro, dude. I just wish it was war and peace. It just, it, <laughs> I know it's pronounced pies, but can you imagine if it was war and peace? <laughs> How fucking great would that be? So right. war and pies at 314 research uh, produces among the best research. Is it yeah, a monk like, or a monk? Like, 
We like that guy. Um, Love that among, guy. Amongst. Either way. Either way. All right, try it on, please. So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at earnings for Q2, beats and misses, and he charts stocks that beat estimates versus stocks that missed estimates. And this is something that we spoke about a lot going to earnings season was we were really curious to see the reaction because the stocks that had been beat up really badly, i.e. you know, crappy businesses that have been missing earnings, had rallied viciously yeah. going into earnings. So it's not a tremendous surprise that a lot of that rally was taken back after they reported earnings. But what is interesting and notable is that not only did stocks that miss get punished, so too did stocks that beat. Oh. It's good, oh. right? So we're back to good news is good, bad news is bad. And I, right, is that the takeaway? Now, I, I wouldn't necessarily overthink it. it. It's it's a really pretty chart. I just think that the stock market got ahead of itself is really all there is to it. And now, you know, we're digesting the earnings and sort of trotting along. Yeah, and you really don't have anything like you have a Fed meeting this week that I think ninety nine expecting ninety nine percent chance of no hike. Yeah, maybe I don't think the, I don't think the markets I don't think the market's expecting much. Maybe they'll way. shock us, but like what, and then you don't have earnings season for a while, so we're like in this no man's land period basically. Yeah, what is what is the next catalyst? And of course nobody knows, but it's pretty quiet right now. Uh yeah, the next catalyst is that they keep dropping these overvalued uh IPOs on, on our heads. We'll see how long before uh the stock market revolts. So let's uh let's move to arms IPO. What'd you think about the way this thing has come and, and gone so far? So went public uh, last week, seemed to have been really well received, closed up 25% on the first day. They priced it at 51, it opened at 63 and a half, and straight down ever no. since. No, 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 it's gone sideways the last few days. I think, this is a, I think this is a definite win. The market absorbed all of this. I agree it's a win. It's yeah. only down 10%, but it's still above its IPO price. Yeah, it's a win. It's 50, it closed at 55 today, yeah? And it was... 50, yeah, yep. Yeah, no, it's just saw, if you bought it the first, if you bought it the first day, you kind of feel like a dick. But other than that, like it's it's not it's not terrible. Not as it's bad a, as if you bought Instacart at the opening tick. It's down like twenty something percent since then. Well, well, I got to tell you, we were all over that. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, anyway, the arm, so the arm thing, they kind of fed into like the AI hype. It's not really an AI company. I guess like any chip company could say there's more demand for our chips because of the AI revolution. But this is not like we want to do more AI stuff. Let's buy more chips from ARM. It's like cell phone chips. Like everyone needs to calm down. I think so uh, they, I but they, ask, they benefited from that. I think uh, NVIDIA is trading beautifully considering how much this stock is up year yeah. to date. Right. Yeah. It's just like it's just digesting all these gains, not really giving much, much back. All right, Instacart uh, priced at 30 last night. It was the upper end of the range. It opened at 42. It had a $14 billion market cap when it started trading. Uh, where did it go out today? Where did it close today? Is that 39 30, ish? Th no, 33 something. Oh, 33. No, so what, yeah, 20% off the highs. Intraday. So what, what was that chart we just had up? Stale. Right. So I, as my final trade on halftime report, I just said, like, sell Instacart. And all... I wasn't like trashing the company. I actually respect what they've been able to do. They did a hard pivot. First, they were being told, get as many users as you can. Don't worry about profitability. Then sometime in late 21, things started to blow up in the private markets. And the new mandate from venture investors was, no, we're just kidding. We want profits now or you'll never be able to go public. And they pulled it off. And they're in like some of the worst parts of American business you could possibly be in. They have to recruit an army of gig workers and somehow have a margin in that. They have to deal with supermarkets, which themselves have like 1% profit margins. Yeah, it's tough. It's a dirty, grimy, ugly uh, business, and they found a way to earn money. So I give them a lot of credit. I just don't want to own the equity. Yeah, but from the advertising, that's going to be the engine of growth. The ad so I said – I made that point today. It's an ad business. Like all that shit they're doing – getting people to go to the supermarket for you, put on a tip, this and that. That's it's like almost, it's almost break even. Yeah. The real business is Pepsi comes in over the top and says, here's $300 million, make sure our products become the number one search result on the app. 
And that's not a bad business. I don't think the stock is wildly overvalued. Now, I'm not buying it. No, tomorrow, I think it's okay. But I, it's, I think it's no. I, so I think it's not growing that fast. Thirty percent growth, and it's in a really tough business. I just I feel like I own Uber. Why why wouldn't I just buy more Uber if I wanted to be bullish on delivery? Uh, you know what I mean? Like or or Amazon. Right. Like why would why do I also want to own this? They're all competing for the same customer. Uber also trading beautifully. Oh, well, Uber's. To me, it's going going much higher. Um, all right, so Instacart's not egregiously overvalued is the point. No. Uh, so they uh, traded four times sales, which is in line with DoorDash, 4.2. Uber is sub three times sales. And Goldman put out something, a guide to the new IPO market. Things have changed since the last IPO market, obviously. And uh, you want to run through some of these charts, Mike? Yeah, we've got we've got three, three charts. Try it on, please. All right, obviously there's been a dearth of IPOs this year. Uh, there was effectively zero in 22, very few in 23, 15, but there's been some big ones. Uh, Birkenstock was big. We've got Instacart. We had uh, Arm. And the one on the right, the chart on the right is very interesting. I don't know what exactly is in here, but they've got a their, their IPO issuance barometer, and it goes uh, high to low, and they're basically showing – whether or not the macro environment is conducive to more or less IPO activity. And of course, it crashed last year for reasons that are very apparent, and it's, it's on the rise. So the market is ready for IPOs, and it seems to be digesting uh, the big ones just fine for now. Can, can we linger on this chart on the left, number of U.S. IPOs? Yeah. Uh, 15 year to date, and last year it looks like there were 16. Is that the, right? Ish? Mm -hmm. That's like a really, I don't know what that's based on. That's like a mean? really uh, – oh, yes, this is did. IPOs raising Demand. more than 25. No, but it's – all right. It's a certain size because I know there were a lot more. They pulled out SPACs, and they're only talking about deals raising more than $25 million, which is essentially Goldman's universe. Like there are IPOs raising $5 Fine. million dollars that yeah. they wouldn't touch. So from that standpoint, we've gone from 261 of those types of deals two years ago to 15 but every year, sort year of IPO date. chart looks exactly the same, whether it's all of them or the total proceeds, yeah. they're just dry. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, next. Uh, this shows the percentage of IPOs reporting at least one quarter of positive net income, and it's showing from 20, 2001 to 2019. So all IPOs from 2001 to 2019, one quarter after their IPO, 41% of these companies were profitable. This is very important. Then four quarters later, 63%. And so these companies were getting profitable pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, the recent batch, on the other hand, so the 2020 and 2021 vintages. Still trash. 14% of them after the first quarter were profitable. Uh, it went up to 40%. Now it's at 52%. So much lower than average. And, still. Still. And these companies have gotten destroyed. Next chart, please. So Goldman uh, produced the 25 largest IPOs. Again, not SPACs. By market cap at the offering price. And holy moly, how many of them outperformed the Russell 3000 since they first started trading? Two. Two yeah. out of 25. This is hard. So th these are, so, I mean, these are, these are, these so are, many. It's Airbnb, Snowflake, DoorDash, Robinhood. These are, these are big names. Toast. Uh, and, and only a uh, Unity. Only two of them have outperformed. Uh, two companies I've never heard of. If, Samsara, which is a software company, and PPD, which is a biotech. Because if you're buying the biggest ones, it's most likely you're buying the ones that are trading at the highest price to sales. And they could come out, like Snowflake has had pretty damn good growth mm -hmm. since it's come public. Too rich. But, but it doesn't matter. It'll never match what the hype was. Right. This was a, this was a, like literally, this was cloud computing backed by Warren Buffett. Like, for, like forget about it. The hype around that deal was so legendary that it was almost impossible for them to grow into that market cap, and they haven't. They still haven't. So it's uh, it's tough, but it's nice to see that there are deals coming back. I think we could both agree. Speaking uh, of deals, let's go to the Schwab up. deal. Chart on, please. There's some Barron's. Uh, Charles Schwab had a decline in its core net new assets the past two months. Uh, is, I'm not sure what to make of this. Um, where is the money? Where is the money going? Well, that's what I wanted to ask you, Josh. Uh, the majority of these deals, and this is from their CFO, the majority of these deals, the de these deal-related outflows have been attributable to, attributable to Ameritrade REA clients, including a select number of relationships that did not meet our criteria for an ongoing service relationship. So, so that's part of it, where uh, 
So net new assets totaled $4.9 billion, down from $43 billion a year earlier and $13 billion in July. So massive, massive drop. So wait, wait, wait. Char chart off, please. The, C so the CFO said that this is like people that they – this was smaller advisors that they're getting rid of? He said what you think he said. Uh, wow. That's a very nice way of saying that they're not servicing the advisors that are sub. Pick a number. 50 million. I don't know what I the number is. I bet it's like under 100. But that does not explain – that is a lot of that is a huge gap. Where did the money go? Did these people go to interactive brokers like Pershing? No. It's a lot of money. There's no way there's no way that amount of people up and went, hey, let's because do you know how long it takes to set up a relationship like a Pershing? It's not an app. Right. Like if you're gonna be doing custody as an advisor, that you probably need like ninety days to put that together. So did people set that up in advance? And then wait for this to close, and then pull money out. It's just like I don't know anyone doing that. So here I know it is. Everyone. Schwab said net new assets totaled four point nine billion dollars last month, but excluding TD Ameritrade clients, it was twenty eight billion. That's a massive. That's a lot yeah. of money. Huh. And I don't think we'll Go ever get to the uh, bottom of it. Goldman. No way. You could have had like two or three very large RIAs just completely cancel their relationship and, and move the whole thing. But that I feel like that takes so long. Yeah, yeah. Like that's not like – that's not flipping a switch. You have repapering yeah. a thousand accounts. Yeah. That's, it's very strange. It's I don't really right, know next. the answer. It'll, it'll come out. Uh, car insurance is up 19% year over year. And this affects me acutely because as you know, I have three drivers in my home now and three cars to insure. And what the hell? This is like, they're talking about sticky inflation. This is beyond sticky. This is like a like abusive. This is gooey. What the hell is going on here? I thought cars were safer these days. <laughs> Could, do you have a do you have a theory behind what why 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 we have to live like this? Like I do. like the like animals. It's a very simple theory, but it's God. a theory nonetheless. These People are being greedy and they're taking the opportunity to use inflation as an opportunity to raise prices. I don't know. What else could it be? Okay. So this is why we need Amazon auto insurance. I have a bad hat with this bullshit. I mean, do you agree so, with that very simple theory? What I don't know. It? Yeah, it's, it's did the it, most did it, did it get more expensive to insure cars on their no. end? No. No, it's, it's the most plausible. What changed? That, what changed was they looked around. They said, hold on. Chipotle put through three price increases. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll do it too. Right? Uh, yeah. Oh, a uh, Chevy Tahoe is now a hundred thousand dollar car. Sure it is. Uh, you know what? Here's yeah. what car insurance costs. Yeah, but nineteen percent in one year. It's egregious. It, it's like what it did, did. Is the gecko asking for more money for the commercials? Like what? Like what? What could possess them to think that's good business? But I guess they're getting away with it's it. It's great business. What are you? Are you canceling your car insurance? Okay, let me read this. Um, this is Axios. Put. We have a chart of this. Oh, we did it already. We did the chart. Okay. Auto insurance prices for American consumers rising at their fastest pace in 40 years, and gasoline prices surged almost 11 percent in August alone. It's a bitch driving a car these days. Uh, that's not Axios. I said that. Um, the surprising size of checks insurers have been forced to write for auto policies is essentially an echo of the vehicle price surge that drove inflation in 2021 and 2022. Aha. So they're framing it as a catch up. The cars cost more. Guess what? The cost to insure them costs more. Do you buy that? I guess. Okay. Yeah. Tight labor markets jacked up Not the cost. Not only do I buy that, I'm embarrassed at my theory because that's much more reasonable. Okay. Uh, prices for auto parts are up thanks to inflation, raising the price of repairs, tight labor markets jacked up the cost of sending your car to the body shop, yeah, lack of right. lack of labor also delayed repairs, resulting in increased insurer spending on car rentals. Yeah, I wish you I wish you read that before I gave my dumb theory. Um, and the cost of payouts for injuries has been driven up by the inflation for healthcare services. So okay, so it's parts, it's labor. It's the, the cost of health care, yep. and all those things feed into the price of health, uh, car insurance. I wish we could invest directly in car insurance without buying the insurance companies. Like, I want to just trade. I want to just trade the average price. And I don't know if I want to fade a 19% annual spike, um, but just generally speaking, 
the price of car insurance is rising faster than most investment options that we well, have this access is, to. This is the shitty thing about rising prices. You think this is ever going down? Do the prices no, ever go they, down? They plateau for a little while. They don't go down. They never go down. You never get a call from your car insurance broker. Great news. Yeah. yeah. Hey, this year, down 19%. Yeah, never. It will never happen. Congratulations. All right. And, and then this is why you invest. Because these companies are really good at protecting their margins. They're really good at it. No doubt. All right, we're going to do Make the Case. Make then we it. Have a, then we have a mystery chart, and then we're going to roll out. Uh, are you following the UFC and WWE merger? Are you, fo- are you like? Do you know anything about what's going on I mean, on I listened here? to Mark Shapiro was on, uh, with Bill Simmons the other day. Uh, Mark Shapiro is a, is a force to be reckoned yeah, with. Yeah, smart guy. All right, so let's start with um, Endeavor. EDR, John, the second chart. That's it. All right. Great job, dude. All right. So here's what this is. Ari Emanuel is the Hollywood super agent that Ari Gold on Entourage was based off of, played by Jeremy Piven. You follow me so far? Okay. This is Endeavor is his holding company, and one of its biggest operating units is WME, which is William Morris... Endeavor. William Morris. Yeah. So William Morris, chart off. William Morris is like one of the most powerful Hollywood agencies. They rep like name a famous person. There's a 50-50 shot that Endeavor, uh, that WME reps them. Okay. They also have some other interesting businesses. They own the bull riding uh, thing, which is not big with the Jews on Long Island. We don't know from that stuff, but that's a sport. They own the whole thing. Um, they also own ICM, which is like sports, man, like sports marketing, like getting athletes, uh, endorsements and shit. Like it's an agency business. They own that too. And then they, um, bid for WWE, which was for sale. And these guys won the bid and Ari Emanuel and Shapiro. And these guys went in there and did a presentation and they were like, guys, here's all the shit that you are not doing that could make world wrestling so much bigger and more profitable. And after an extensive presentation, whatever, like uh, Vince McMahon looked at them and said, okay, brother, you know, like, like, we'll, we'll, okay. So that's how they want it. So here's what they did. Next chart, TKO. So this is called Endeavor Operating Company. It will change its name. TKO represents a merger of, um, a merger of WWE, as well as like their whole uh, UFC business, which Endeavor also owned. They merged the two things. They're telling Wall Street they're gonna find 50 to $100 million worth of synergies in terms of the expense of running these leagues. But now you can invest directly in fighting. Uh, TKO is like this huge thing now. And I think it's up there with every other professional sports league, whether it's the NFL or baseball or hockey, just in terms of like viewers around the world, how many events they put on 350 events a year. Unlike real sports, they actually, I shouldn't say real, unlike traditional sports leagues, there's no season. It's every day. There's something either UFC or wrestling going on uh, all seasons and it's global. And uh, I think these guys are going to make this work. So the way this shakes out is if you buy uh, Endeavor, the first chart I showed you, EDR, owns 51% of the stock in TKO, the votes. And World Wrestling ended up with 49%. I think Vince McMahon is like the executive chairman or something, and he has 16 for himself. So it's basically going to be like this huge collection of personalities. You got Dana White in there uh, representing UFC. You got Vince, who's in his 70s. You got Ari Emanuel, who just does not lose. And you got uh, Mark Shapiro. And they're going to make a run at turning this into a much, much bigger, more profitable global sports entity. And they might even be making other acquisitions. So I like it. Now the question is, do you buy TKO, just the wrestling and fighting business? Or do you buy Endeavor, which is the majority shareholder of that, plus all of those other businesses that may or may not be undervalued, like the talent agency, for example. So I'm going to make the case that you go either or. 
if one of them works, the other one will work. Um, if I were to buy one, I would probably buy EDR and just make the bet that the wrestling business will succeed, um, but also some of the other things they own are being like given away for free in terms of like the current valuation. Um, so that's, that's the pitch. I'm not in either of these stocks right now, but this just happened in the last week, and I wanted to uh, shed a little bit of light on this for the viewers. you have any thoughts on, on the trade? Yeah, it's just interesting. We were talking about Instacart earlier. Would you rather own TKO at a sub $9 billion market cap or Instacart at 11? Now, I don't know how much debt TKO has, so I don't know what the apples to apples actual comparison is. But uh, how, about, how about they say they convert 61 cents of every dollar in revenue they bring in to cash flow? Like it's actually enormously profitable, shockingly profitable given how mature of a business. You know, this wrestling shit's been around for 40 years. It's, it's shocking how profitable this business is. Yeah, I think that's a good pitch. If this was a, a different market environment, this thing would be worth way more. I think it's going up. Do you see how well it did today? It looks good. Like, like, apropos of nothing, I think it went up 5% today. People have not really discovered the stock. It's, a TKO is not even trading under the, the name it's going to trade under eventually. They're not going to call it Endeavor Operating Co. for, you know, for much longer. Um, the here's the risk. Here's the risk. There are two upcoming events where they're going to redo their contracts. One for UFC, one for wrestling. The wrestling one matters the most. It's much bigger. They have a deal with NBC, uh, and then they have a deal with, I think, Fox. One is Raw, and one is whatever the other show. I'm not a, I don't watch this shit. So they, they, they are going to have to announce, here's what our next contract is. So the bet you have to make is that they're going to get a lot more money for the rights to these shows than they got last time. I think that's a safe bet, but that is a risk if they don't. All the right. second the second risk is all those people I just mentioned are all fucking crazy. Like Vince McMahon is legitimately crazy. Uh, Dana White is not a shrinking violet. They might all hate each other, and this whole thing might blow up. Um, if somebody says the wrong thing and the other one disagrees publicly, it could that, like I feel like the risk here is personality. Um, but I, I'd be willing to take that risk. I think uh, I think this stuff's gonna work. So, all right, you got a mystery chart? I do. So this is a stock that I happen to own. I'm underwater, about eight uh, percent. It's a it's a company. No, I don't want to. It's a company that uh, it's a it's a it's a product that I use. Product might be the wrong word. It's a service that I use. Let's put it that way. It's a service that I use. This stock has been under pressure. That's a 200 day moving average that it uh, bounced off today. We'll see. Tomorrow's another day. Uh, this is a product that you use. It's a, I, it, I said service. It's a service that I use. This has been under pressure, uh, primarily due to rising oil prices. So between this right, and my wait, energy stocks, I have to I'm, pause. We have some I'm, really good We have some I'm, really good guesses. I'm perfectly hedged. Go ahead. Uh, Patrick asked, "Is it shampoo?" <laughs> LOL. Uh, Sean Graylish guessing Peloton. Mm -mm. Few, no, few come on, Sean. That's Peloton's not a bad guess. Peloton, no, Peloton it does not look like this. Oh, you're showing us the price too, thirty nine. Okay. Uh, all right. I don't. Let, all right. Is it a subscription? When you say service, is it a subscription? Is it it's like entertainment? No. And they, it's it's high priced items. It's high. It's a high priced service, I should say. Mm. Not relative to its peers, but it's it's a high it's a high it's a high okay. cost. James uh, Sykes is asking, is it mudroom construction? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, listen to me. This 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 company is under pressure. The sector is under pressure from rising oil prices, which is mm. a huge input to their business. Huh? Come on, dude. What? I, I don't. How would I know? I don't know. How would I know? I give up. I I, I could lose. I I know you're. It's crazy. You never see me lose ever. I'm losing. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Go ahead. What is it? Uh, wait. One more. One more chart. One more chart. Next chart. Is it a jet Same. ski? No, no, no. Same thing. John, next chart. Before the reveal. Before the reveal. This is uh, the week. This is, uh, again, it's a 200-day. Uh, it's, it's, it's an airline. Thank you. Oh, uh, it's not a service. It's a why service. Are you, why, why, are you, why are you bamboozling me? It's not a, it's not a fucking airline. good airline. I know, but like an airline, is, not, is it a service? Absolutely. Yeah, I guess it is. All right. Uh, it's it's Delta. Delta. Okay. Yeah. All right. I almost, I almost, given another second, I probably would have gotten it. Okay. <laughs> um, wait, it, this is under pressure from oil and probably from unrealistic comps. 
that it will be very difficult for them to achieve in 2024. And people are already uh, pricing that in. It's very possible that 2023 is the best year that it has yeah. uh, in the next two years. Very possible. Yeah, And that's not just Delta. That'll be everybody in the space. Very possible. So. But it's best in class. I love it. I use it. I'm sticking with it. All right. Great job on the mystery chart. Hey, everybody. Tonight is, <laughs> tonight is Tuesday, which means tomorrow, Wednesday morning, uh, you are invited to an all-new episode of my favorite podcast, Animal Spirits, starring Michael and Ben. Uh, ben is doing a live Ask the Compound Thursday afternoon on YouTube. And then at the end of the week, boy, oh boy, do we have a very special guest on the Compound and Friends. You don't even know what's going on. Uh, I might get a haircut for that. I didn't tell you this. I might get a little trim tomorrow. Uh, I want to I wanna look my best. So, all right. Hey, guys, thanks so much for I watching. I might grow Make a mustache. Sure. Michael might grow some facial hair. You have two days. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to leave a review, a rating, whatever it is, depending on the platform. We love you. We'll see you tomorrow.